My name is Ricky Wong. I'm Executive Director of Community Affairs at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, I want to introduce my colleague, uh, Jackie Kennedy. Yeah, hi, I'm Jackie Kennedy. I'm also with the Health Department, but um, under the Center for Health Equity, and I serve as the Director of Community Partnerships. Right. So I'll just kind of give like um, a little bit of background about you know uh, what we do day to day and what our role is actually in response to uh, you know the measles, measles outbreak here in Brooklyn. Uh, day to day, um, you know, I generally field. Uh, I have a I have a staff of five. I have liaisons for each borough, and we deal with the day to day issues uh, that affect um, uh, you know people from a health department perspective, uh, whether it's. You know, somebody has a complaint about rats. Uh, you know, we inspect the restaurants locally, the local food vendors as well too. Uh, and then somebody may ask us to come and do, uh, you know, have on a program to give a presentation on obesity or chronic disease prevention, such as tobacco or something like that as well too. So my staff, we organize that. In the outbreak, uh, I'm considered what they call the public information officer or the deputy public information officer. And we're basically charged with working with our Bureau of Immunization and our disease control uh, doctors to basically get information out to the public, whether it's through the media, uh, you know, information pamphlets like this that we help to create. Um, you know, social media is a big component as well, too. Uh, and then, you know, and by extension, working with community partners, which is what Jackie's kind of covering. Right. So, um it is we feel that it's incredibly important to tap into our community partnerships so at the health department we partner through contracts <laughs> both informally through programs um, to connect with the community connect with residents participants um, and so our community partners are extremely important and so as we kind of what we call activate to respond to public health emergencies we created a community partner engagement unit and so it's a new unit and <laughs> we've been really trying to do things like this where we present out to community partners get the word out make sure everyone's informed and so that's kind of the role that i've been playing in this in this outbreak Right. So for full disclosure, neither Jackie or I are clinicians. At all. We, have, we have no science mm -hmm. backgrounds whatsoever. We just have a lot of experience in the backgrounds of like engaging communities and working with community partners. Uh, I also do a lot with the political realm, so any elected officials or anything like that as well too. That's my day to day, and you know I've been keeping the local elected officials here and city hall up to date about you know what's going on with the outbreak. So. Uh, just want folks to kind of be aware of that. I know this is an immunology class, I think that's what it is. So uh, we try to get our doctors to come, but they're unfortunately they're busy working on the outbreak in itself and addressing that. So uh, let's get right into the presentation. Uh, I will ask folks, if you can't hear me, just raise your hands, but please hold your questions until the end. I know folks are going to probably have a lot of questions. Uh, we just kind of want to get to the presentation and we'll be happy to stay around answering the questions. Okay? I'll click through for you. Sure. So, measles virus. Uh, folks are not aware we do have an outbreak in <laughs> Brooklyn, uh, mostly situated in four zip codes, which we have kind of arbitrarily identified as Williamsburg, though parts of Borough Park as well, too, but it encompasses other neighborhoods uh, as well, too. So, just don't think that. It's limited to just Williamsburg. There are four zip codes that we officially declared a uh, health order for and where the vast majority of cases are. So what exactly is measles? It's highly contagious viral uh, infection, uh, generally characterized by fever and a rash that you see in the pictures here. Usually, you mostly see it in children. Uh, so, you know, the folks are not aware of what uh, that is, that's what measles is. Uh, and we can talk about how, how contagious it is later on. Um, How is it spread? So, usually if somebody's infected and they're infectious, uh, and they either cough or sneeze, and it becomes airborne. Um, it, you know, uh, anybody that comes in contact with that can basically become uh, infected if they are not immune, which means they're either not vaccinated or they have not previously been exposed to measles and recovered from it uh, as well too. 
Uh, it's considered one of the most contagious viruses out there. So let's say if I was in one corner of the room and I had it, and I just call another person in that corner of the room can potentially get it, and it'll stay around the environment for up to two hours. All right, so that's how infectious it is. And, you know, and basically it can cause other health issues. Uh, this is basically exposure to natural measles. Uh, usually uh, any, uh, uh, any uh, you know, uh, follow-up symptoms or, or uh, complications are like diarrhea, ear infections, pneumonia. We have had cases of pneumonia in our outbreak uh, that we have. Um, you know, it's very serious in basically all age groups, but however, you know, much more so in vulnerable populations such as infants, uh, young children, uh, pregnant people, uh, people who have uh, compromised immune systems or suppressed immune systems, and they're more likely to suffer from these uh, complications versus a healthy person as well, too, and versus somebody who's been vaccinated. Uh, in some cases, you know, and it's very rare, but there is an instance of where it can, it can cause death. And that's the, how seriously we kind of want to address it. You know, we don't want folks to take it lightly that, oh, you get it and you kind of, you know, you kind of recover from it. No, you can, if you get exposed to natural occurring measles, you, there are complications from it. So what's the treatment for measles? So you can't, there's no cure or direct treatment for measles itself. You can treat the symptoms. So if somebody had a fever, you would give them something for the fever. If you had other symptoms as well too, the cough or, or uh, the rash, you would give other medications as well too. Obviously the best way to you know, uh, treat measles <coughs> before uh, an exposure to measles is basically to get vaccinated. And that's the you know, most you know, preventative medicine that we can kind of you know, uh, recommend for anybody. It's safe, vaccines are safe. Uh, and we'll talk about you know, the safety of the vaccines as well too. But you know, we also advise folks that if they've been exposed and they start you know, becoming symptomatic that they should avoid you know, uh, coming into contact with other folks, stay home, uh, especially when the rash manifests itself as well too. Um, generally, if somebody's sick, we recommend they contact their doctor first, speak with them because there are infection protocols that need to kind of be in place before somebody actually goes to see a doctor. We've had what they call nosocomial transmissions, uh, which means that it's transmissions in healthcare settings because uh, like a waiting room gets inundated with patients waiting to see a doctor and somebody's sitting there and they're actively, you know, um, you know sick with measles, they can transmit it to the, the other patients if those patients have not been vaccinated or if they have suppressed immune systems or one of those vulnerable populations as well too. And so what are vaccines and how do they work? So vaccines basically, uh, you know, something that simulates a, a, a person's immunity uh, to reduce a, a, an immune response specific to that disease and to protect them from that disease uh, as well too. They've been developed to imitate an infection, but usually that imitation infection doesn't cause the actual illness in itself. Uh, they're generally administered through needles, though there are nasal and mouth uh, 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 interventions as well too. Uh, I just want to, you know, we'll talk about this more, but, you know, the measles mumps rubella vaccine is, you know, categorically safe. There's a lot of misinformation out there about vaccines and how there are concerns about it. And that's actually part of the reason why we're dealing with this outbreak, uh, because of the misinformation that's out there. Uh, so what is the MMR? Is it effective? Right. So MMR stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. And the reason why they lump these three together is because generally they're given to children. And if you have like a one-year-old, instead of giving three shots, you give one shot and you know, you're not dealing with a crying one-year-old that's you know, struggling through a whole bunch of shots through their, you know, the course of their you know, uh, uh, infancy. And that's why they lump them all together. The recommendations, both from the CDC and from the health departments, that usually at age one, you get the first dose, uh, and it's 93% effective. Uh, usually between the ages of four and six, you would get the second dose, and that boosts the efficacy up to 97%. It's not complete 100% immunity from it, but it's basically like a shield, and it's better to have that versus natural exposure uh, to measles. 
and the complications that kind of come with it. Uh, even after exposure, you know, we still recommend uh, getting a vaccination uh, as well too. Uh, most people who receive uh, the MMR generally don't have uh, side effects. Uh, the, the most common form of side effects is usually a mild fever. But I will say that if it was, you know, somebody who's immunocompromised who we don't recommend getting the vaccination, they potentially can develop, uh, you know, measles from uh, the type of vaccination as well too if they were to take it. That's why the recommendation against giving that, you know, uh, vaccination to those folks. Obviously, again, you mentioned scientifically proven that MMR is safe. Hundreds and hundreds of studies involving thousands and hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, there's no links to autism that's been brought up before. Uh, there's concerns about the interior chemicals. The, the actual vaccines have been refined over the years. Certain chemicals that were of concern have been removed from those vaccines. And it's, again, proven to be safe. Right. So, uh, just really quickly, why, why is measles back, right? So... <laughs> Um, in 2000, measles was actually um, el eliminated, so it was declared eliminated um, in the U.S., which is wonderful news. However, it kind of reared its ugly head once again in the 90s. Um, and so in, two, in, excuse me, in 2013, we had, so in between 2000 and 2013, we've had like very small outbreaks. So if anybody get if people start to get it and transmit it, you know, we call it an outbreak. But in 2013, we had kind of the largest outbreak since it was eliminated. And as kind of these graphs, this graph shows, I think we hit across the U.S. about 660, almost 670. And um, as you know, now in 2019, we are currently um, in the largest outbreak um, that we've had since it was eradicated or eliminated. Um, it's happening across the US, it's actually happening across the world. So oftentimes um, we get outbreaks because of people traveling from other countries. And so not every country has the same kind of guidelines around vaccination. So for example, in Israel where, you know, the vaccination is you just required to get one vaccine versus we have a booster here. So under vaccination could be a problem, but oftentimes before kind of 2019, the, the, our outbreaks kind of happened because of the traveling between countries and bringing it into the States, which is also similar to this outbreak, right? We've had, that's kind of how it started. And, and at this point we are at 400, <clears throat> sorry. 466 cases. So as of yesterday, um, we are currently at 466 confirmed cases. Um, we're constantly, and Ricky will go into this later, um, constantly uh, doing tests to figure out like who else uh, has carried uh, measles. But this um, ranges from one years old to 66 years years of age, right? So there's no, although most of the cases overwhelmingly are children, which is actually quite scary since they're so um, kind of vulnerable. Um, we've had uh, 213 were under four and then 98 uh, were five to 17 years of age. Mm -hmm. And so we've had 34 hospitalizations, um, nine persons, nine people were admitted to ICU um, but we haven't had any fatalities, which is a, a blessing, really. And I think it's really because of kind of where we are in this in this country. Um, so, yeah. <coughs> so we want to really target as we go around and talk to different communities and different people. Um, the fact that, uh, of stigma, right? Um, stigma is real specifically in this city where we have so many diverse cultures, so many diverse groups of people. And although measles, the measles outbreak has happened, um, mostly it has mostly impacted the or, or Orthodox Jewish community, 
Um, I like to say, you know, the community is insular, but not isolated, right? So they really is in that community because it is an insular community, which is kind of, it sucks, but it's also helpful for everybody else, but it's, it's challenging because it's so insular and it's because of, um, are we, we try to say that they're not the reason for the outbreak, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the fact of the community being insular and, and children being so um, close to one another and families being so close to one another, the transmission is much easier. And so what we're trying to do as an agency is to you know definitely target our outreach to those communities, make sure that they're vaccinated, get them as much information as possible, but also make sure that everyone else knows if you're immunized, like you don't have to be concerned, you don't have to worry. So the root of the cause is really the spread that we believe of misinformation. So a lot of anti-vax material we have found has gone into this very insular community and other insular communities. I think the Amish were targeted in other cities and across the country. And so the anti-vax movement has targeted insular communities like the Orthodox Jewish community. And now we are seeing an outbreak across the country. Um, and although the current outbreak, again, is predominantly concentrated in this community, it's not a religious issue. There's no doctrine that says, do not vaccinate your children. Um, we've talked to several rabbis, we've talked to several folks across the community that believe this and stand by this. And so we just wanna pass that on, pass that along to your friends and family, because this is how the message starts, right? Stigma starts by word of mouth. So we can destigmatize also by word of mouth. Um, like many other communities, um, it's a close, close knit community, which makes it easy, easy to spread. And so we want to make sure that the spread doesn't happen in other communities. So vaccination is the key. Um, the Orthodox Jewish community also has high rates of vaccination, just like everyone else, but it only takes a small group a small population of folks to um, for this to spread, right? So um, the root, or excuse me, we know that you know families want the best for their children. All families want the best for their children, including the Orthodox Jewish community. And so uh, I think if we keep that in mind, that their Orthodox Jewish folks are just like everybody else. They want the best for their family. They want the best for their children. They have high rates of vaccination, just like everyone else. So if we can practice kind of destigmatizing this concept and this topic of measles, um, I think it will go a really long way, specifically as we go through this. I think we have, Ricky and I were talking a, a bit earlier today that, you know, we're kind of in the heart of it. Like, trans, um, the incubation period takes 21 days. So this will be we'll be here for a while is my point and so we want to make sure that we're not stigmatizing one community over the other okay. so who should not be vaccinated this is a question that comes up before i get to who should let's talk about who should not so anyone as ricky said um who has a weakened immune system who has any allergy to any um, vaccinations in the past, um, shot, probably should talk to their doctor before they get vaccinated. Um, if you recently had a blood transfusion or um, have received other blood byproducts, um, if you have a severe illness at the time, so just like with the flu, that if you're sick, you probably shouldn't get it at the time, you should wait. Um, and lastly, if you're under six months of age, uh, people can only get vaccinated between six years old, or we start the vaccination between six months old and one years old. So that's about the time you can get your first shot. Anything below that, um, you cannot be vaccinated. So these are the groups of people that we like to say is most vulnerable to, um, to measles. So again, these are case by case scenarios. So the greatest recommendation is to talk to your doctor, talk to your provider. If you don't have a doctor, there are tons of FQHCs, excuse me, this is, 
acronyms. Acronyms. <laughs> uh, go to kind of the nearest clinic, or federal call, federally qualified health center in your neighborhood um, to get treated. Um, so who should be vaccinated? Everyone, everyone should be vaccinated. If you if you're unsure of your vaccination history, go to your doctor, see a doctor somewhere who could support kind of digging into your history or doing a test to find out if you're vaccinated or not. So we um, and you'll learn about this in a minute <laughs> as the health department um, issued an order for everyone who lives, works in 11205, 11206, 11211, and 11249 must be vaccinated. So when we say who should be vaccinated, everyone, but specifically everyone in those four zip codes are by order kind of required and mandated to get vaccinated. So, um, just some special notes. So children between six to 11 months, again, specifically living in the affected zip codes, a lot of people like to wait until they're one years old, but if you know of a child or if there is a child in your household who's between that age, go ahead and get them vaccinated, especially if you live in that zip code, those zip codes. Um, one years of age or older, again, vaccinated, um, and if you don't vaccinate, like you're putting your child and you're putting other people and other folks in those areas at risk. Um, you want me to come in? Yeah. Okay. So uh, measles is a public health emergency. Um, so we officially declared a public health emergency uh, <clears throat> and we activated what we call our incident command structure at the health department about a month ago. Uh, we actually been dealing with this outbreak since September of 2018. And, you know, it's a basically a domino effect. Uh, and, and the reason why it's like, you know, a single child with measles who attended uh, a local uh, school, uh, you know, wasn't excluded, which there was an exclusion order in place, and that order was that, you know, within these zip codes, if you have children that either had a medical or religious exemption from getting vaccinations, those schools were ordered to, to, to keep those kids from coming to school. Some of the schools, unfortunately, did not follow those orders. They allowed one kid in, in and, inf and unfortunately, you know, it became a domino effect and infected 40 other people. And, you know, now, you know, consistently, I would say every week, we're seeing anywhere from as little as like a dozen to 20 cases to up to this past week, 43 cases. So we're going to kind of continue to see this. <laughs> and these are the chains of transmissions that we're kind of investigating as well, too. This is a very unique and dangerous outbreak you know, with a very high number of children in a specific community, uh, very low uh, vaccine coverage in the zip codes uh, in comparison to other parts of the, of the city as well too, between different age groups as well too. Uh, so, you know, there's been encouragement obviously for folks to get vaccinated. Uh, since we started the out, uh, uh, investigating the outbreak September, I think about <laughs> In those four specific zip codes, we have about 20,000 vaccinations. Uh, since we issued our public health order mandating vaccination in those four zip codes in April, we've had an additional 2,000 vaccinations. So there's not, it's, it's less so about, you know, vaccine hesitancy or, you know, mis it's more so about addressing the misinformation and basically preventing people from getting sick. So that's why you know, we've been able to, you know, try to curb and bend the uh, number of cases, but we're going to kind of, kind of continue to see this. So the role of the health department, and I'm going to kind of expand a little bit about what we're doing, both in measles, but everything else that we do as well, too. This is the first thing is contact uh, and case investigation. This is what we've termed in the public realm as our disease detectives. These are our doctors, our epidemiologists, uh, you know, maybe some of you folks here in the room as well, too, one day. Um, they, you know, by law, uh, measles is what they call a reportable disease. Any doctor's office, uh, you know, clinic, hospital, they, they clinically diagnose a case of measles. By law, they have to report it to the health department. That's how they track it. 
<laughs> then the these detectives take over and they do their case and contact investigation. They talk with the family, they talk with the actual case patient to see where they've been, where the potential cases for exposure might be as well too. Then we look for other exposures and that's why we're able to find out more and more cases. Uh, the next one is our public health lab. We perform you know, thousands and thousands of diagnostic tests. Uh, so we're investigating and you know, checking all those cases that are kind of coming in as well too. Uh, so for overall knowledge as well, we also had investigated the Ebola case in 2014. Uh, in 2015, we dealt with the large Legionnaires outbreak in the Bronx. Uh, in 2016 was Zika, and then now, of course, measles. So every year, it's something always kind of pops up. Um, if you ever hear about in the news somebody, you know, got an envelope with white powdery substance, that actually goes to our public health lab through the NYPD. So we're the ones actually testing that as well, too. Um, so uh, that's that part of the response. School care and child care outreach and oversight. We actually license a lot of child care providers. Any daycares, uh, any after school programs, uh, you know, and we also have school health uh, as part of the health department and working with the Department of Education for the public schools uh, as well too. So we've done continued outreach to them. In the public school uh, uh, realm, you know, before you enter the public school system, you have to be vaccinated. There are obviously regulations that allow for medical or religious exemptions as well too, but there's very high rates of vaccinations in the public school realm. Um, provider, uh, you know, and healthcare uh, facility outreach. So we, we liaise and network with all the local hospitals. We send out health alerts to the local clinics and also the local uh, doctors as well too, advising them when there is an outbreak or a high instance of cases and things that, you know, that are, are kind of like come across our table to advise them, you know, something's happening in this community. If you have a case patient that presents something like that, make sure you do such and such guidance as well too, so they know to look for the symptoms and how to also provide uh, treatment as well. And then <laughs> lastly is what, you know, Jackie and I were kind of talking about before as well too. We get the community involved. We believe in transparency. You know, we want to make sure that folks are knowing what's kind of going on in their communities, you know, regardless if there's an emergency. You know, there's general things that happen that, are, that affect overall public health and we want to make sure that people are aware about but especially in an emergency, we want folks to know, to know, you know, what the symptoms are, what the root causes are, how to seek treatment, where to seek treat, uh, care as well too. And we want to make sure that this information gets across, you know, in an equitable fashion as well too. So uh, just a brief summary of the city's health order. Uh, this emergency declaration, again, that Jackie mentioned, you know, affects Four specific zip codes in Brooklyn: 11205, 11206, 11211, and 11249. By order of the health commissioner, and it's under her authority, uh, that you know, folks residing, working, uh, traveling into these areas have to be vaccinated. Uh, basically, um, if we find out through contact tracing or through case investigation that you're not, we will, you know, potentially issue a violation to that person that goes to the individual. And I think to date, it's, uh, I think we have 80 individuals that have been issued violations already. Those have yet to be kind of adjudicated, which means they have to go through the court process and stuff, but each violation carries a fine of up to $1,000. So if you're talking about a family household, and let's say there's five people and they're all unvaccinated, and we are able to link that together, you're talking about potentially $5,000 right there. You know, it's not our goal to gain somebody with a fine. Our goal is to make sure that people get vaccinated and nobody gets sick, uh, anything like that. So that's why we uh, had to declare that uh, order. So as we wrap up, we just kind of want to drive home the idea of, of misinformation and how powerful it is. So the document that you're looking at here with the X over it to say like, this is not what we want to promote. Um, this is, you know, a very, it looks very legitimate. It looks like it's going to capture my attention as a parent. And so these are the kind of things that we're trying to combat as a health department, um, kind of 
not not the most legitimate uh, sources of information, but they're promoting this and pushing this to parents across the country and specifically to our communities in Brooklyn. And so we see that the resurgence of measles is not just a measles outbreak, but it's a misinformation. It's an outbreak of misinformation to very vulnerable um, people. Um, and so it's really been our greatest challenge to counter kind of the anti-vaxxer movement. If you like go on any comment, Facebook, whatever, you'll see like five anti-vaxxers like attacking one person about, you know, really promoting vaccination. And, you know, those are their ideas, but we know that the only way to kind of protect yourself, protect your families and protect others from measles is through vaccination. So it's a true kind of like war of information happening right now. And the most um, kind of effective way to tackle this is through passing on the information to residents across the city. And so a really good example of this is um, peach versus pie. So peach is a group of parents who promote uh, anti-vaccines and, and they're kind of like what we call anti-vaxxers. And it's, re it's really gorgeous, right? It's really pretty. It looks very formal and very um, legitimate. But this has gone out to thousands and thousands of parents, specifically in the ultra-Orthodox com Jewish community. And um, people are really taking this on and it really kind of gets at, you know, their cultural beliefs, their religious beliefs. Um, and a person actually within the community that we started to work with saw this and she was a nurse and she said, you know what, this is wrong. You're getting wrong information into the hands of my community and it's causing this outbreak. So she then created pie and we call it, then we create a slice of pie to try to get out during Passover. but. Um, we tried to partner with this community resident who really saw the need and really tried to get her resources to get this document out to counter the misinformation um, that we have been seeing. And lastly, we want to make sure we know where you can get vaccinated. We keep telling you, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. Well, where do I get vaccinated? So one of um, our health department uh, immunization clinic is at the Fort Greene Health Center. That's where anyone can get vaccinated regardless of your, um, you know, your documentation, your citizenship, regardless of if you have um, health insurance or not. This is probably the best place to go. It's in Brooklyn. It's on Flatbush Avenue Extension, so I'm not too far from here. And there's four other kind of healthcare centers that we have. So we want to make sure that we're promoting where you can actually get vaccinated. And lastly, um, you have additional resources. So the health department, again, we're trying to really push this transparency angle and we update every week, update our website with more information with our case count. So if you're ever wondering like where we are in this, you can definitely go to our health department website at www.nyc.gov slash health slash measles. Very simple. Um, CDC, because this is a national outbreak right now across the US, they are also updating their website. They also have tons and tons and tons of information that you can tap they have flyers, they have, we have posters and flyers too, but they have posters and flyers. So um, if you want to access to that, I also have, um, so a slice of pie, which is not the easiest uh, website link to remember. And then Zim Gazin is another um, useful resources, useful resource that we kind of supported getting to in the hands of other community <laughs> residents that was created by another community group um, actually in, in um, New York State and then we got it in the hands of our folks down here in New York City um, and the last is Immunization Action which is an organization um, that promotes immunization so that's another great resource that 
everyone has access to and can use. So, thank you. Any questions? And honestly, we want quite, so if you have a question and you're like, well, they're not doctors, they're not going to know, yes. still ask it because honestly, we've been asking the hard questions and trying to get answers and you're our first presentation. So we want to make sure that we pull these questions and get answers for them for other community-based presentations. Yes. Um, do also test for titers? So if you get your CERC, do they give you more information? <coughs> So, uh, at the Fort Greene Clinic, I don't know if they do the titers test. Um, I want to say the other locations that we mentioned, the so local uh, health and hospitals corporate uh, health and hospitals uh, locations, and the uh, federally uh, qualified health uh, clinics. These are actually full blown clinics that are partners in the communities. They will have clinicians that will be able to do a titers test if necessary, and then you know make the assessment of whether a booster is required or not. That's a really great question, and I feel like that. I is... didn't hear it. Can you repeat? Oh yeah. So the question was, how are we enforcing vaccination in the communities where they have already stated, this is my belief, this is my religious belief. Some people feel it's religious, people combated it and said, no, but so yeah, if they said this is my strong belief, religious or not, like how are we combating it? And honestly, the best we could do is information and in peer, peer to peer. So if, say for example, it's like a mother's circle and you're the one mother who's like strong and wrong, or just strong and you're like, I don't want to say Everybody has the right to their own beliefs. So if you're strong in that belief, but you have the peer pressure of these other mothers saying like, look girl, like my kid plays with your kid and I really need you to do this, then um, so it's, it's kind of like peer, peer to peer, community to, to community. Um, we are, we also met with a lot of um, religious leaders to say like, can you actually tell your followers like, and mind you, also Orthodox community is not all the same, like there's different sects, so we don't want to act like everyone's the same, but um, tapping into those religious leaders to kind of disprove the statement that this is a religious kind of thing when for, for for that community specifically because i can't speak for all kind of religious backgrounds it's not in the doctrine and so really trying to push that as well right and then working with local like um religious uh, affiliated organizations or actual like community-based organizations that work with that population uh, and supporting them to get information out, but some of them, uh, they've even gone as far as like, you know, we support it, we're concerned about this in our community, we want to do a vaccination event. And, you know, they asked us, what can we do to help as the health department? We know that there's a mistrust of government, because we are a government agency, and of, you know, uh, of us uh, as well, too. They would never come to us and ask us for a vac vaccination event. But if I went to a, a community organization which helps them with their day to day, you know, uh, you know, things, you know, they can potentially hold the event. They would bring in their own community doctors. What we would do behind the scenes would be basically supplying the vaccine because we manage the chain of vaccines that are kind of supplying the community, but also furnish them with any additional resources as well too maybe connect them with another partner that brings in the needles and the swabs and everything like that, and they can do that. And then bring in somebody that can actually test for titers or actually check the citywide immunization registry to see if somebody has uh, been vaccinated before as well, too. Please. So maybe it's too early to tell, but I was just wondering from these sort of community engagement events and things like that, have you noticed, I guess, an increase in rates of vaccination? Have people started you know, because of the outbreak itself mm -hmm. and they know that the outbreak is happening, are people 
now going back on their you know, stance on those I think there's there's a lot of people that have been on the fence and, you know, with the misinformation that's out there and they were waiting for more, you know, uh, you know, more guidance from us as well, too. And also from their religious leaders and other organizations. And yes. So as I mentioned before, since the start of the outbreak in like uh, September of 2018, We've seen an increase in that community of about 20,000 uh, vaccinations, which is great. Uh, since the order itself, which was back in April, uh, from that time till now, it's about an increase of about 2,000 vaccinations. So, uh, you know, I we would like to believe that the mandate helped, but we want we wanted to make sure that folks m understand that you know they're making the correct and right decision by choosing to vaccinate and uh, kind of going on beyond what's, you know, uh, the, the misinformation out there or, and, or any misconceptions about their, you know, the religious exemptions or anything like that as well, too, so. I have a question. I live in Rockland County, and I know that this is often mm -hmm. one of the first places that have affected. And um, I know the government was imposing fines on the schools if they were allowing children to come to school unvaccinated. So that's one way they were trying to curtail the spread. Yeah. But my other question is, this is college, and I know there was some rule saying if you were born before 1956, <coughs> you don't need to have the MMR vaccine. But if you were born after that, you need to have proof that you got the vaccination. Yeah. Now that we are seeing an increase in measles, even up to 77 years old, right. I'm wondering, uh, is the health department rethinking yes. that policy? That's so our, I think our language has actually changed to just follow up with your doctor and, and see if you have, uh, if you're immunized. To your point, we do have people, if you're 66, you're definitely born before 57. <laughs> So, yes, I, our language has definitely been to see your doctor if you're unsure of your immunization or of your, if you're immune to measles, follow up with your doctor is, is the language. Yeah, and we, you know, we know everybody's situation is different. I don't know if folks know that if, um, if a woman's pregnant and she was previously vaccinated, pregnancy is considered a medical condition. It can actually change her immunity. And so generally when after they you know, give birth, you know, and then if they're if they're breastfeeding or not depends, they would basically have to consult, you know, their obstetrician slash pediatrician to see when they potentially would follow up for, you know, and if they need to be retested to check what their immunity uh, as well, too. So scenarios are a little bit different. But yes, generally anybody between, you know, 1957 to probably like the like early 1980s probably only got received the one dose of MMR and you know uh, if you're not sure about your immunity and uh, or your vaccination history because the record keeping was kind of you know not so great at that time uh, the recommendations go to see your doctor if they can't look up your vaccination history they can do the titers test check your immunity and see how that is and then they would suggest whether or not you need the booster any generally anybody after born after the like mid to late 1990s, their records were actually computerized and it's in, uploaded into the citywide immunization registry. So there's a citywide immunization registry, and our doctors and local doctors can basically go into that and check based on you know person's name and the date of birth. Um, if you happen to be uh, an ID NYC holder, if you have an ID NYC from the city. You can also access that information as well, too, based on that information that's associated with it. So I know uh, that <coughs> some of the, well, some schools have been kind of even closed down because they didn't enforce a policy of, of checking the vaccination issue of students. And I was wondering, was that received well by the community or? Mm -hmm. So they, I think. They were they were given warnings. Uh, we had actually instituted school exclusions. I want to say sometime like uh, late November, and they all received communications, which you know we want to make sure that people are fully aware of what's going on. So it's like if you operated such and such daycare or such and such yeshiva or something like that in these zip codes, 
if you have students in attendance uh, with either religious or medical exemptions, so either one, uh, you are to exclude them from attending school until we officially declare that the outbreak is over or we clear your school or the zip code you know, to go ahead and let students kind of back in. And what we do is that, you know, since we want to oversee, uh, you know, uh, child care in, in, a, in a specific realm, our inspectors go and check these locations, for, you know, on a day to day basis anyway to make sure. And, you know, one of the things that they were checking was <laughs> attendance records. And <laughs> we, we know it's tough. You know, the school sometimes, you know, mom or dad drops the kid off or throws them on the bus and the bus drops them off. And, you know, the, you know, then it's up to the school an hour or two later to figure out, hey, this kid was not supposed to be here. They need to be sent home. But if that kid happens to be sick or infectious, that becomes a very kind of difficult issue. So, you know, it's uh, and I want to say that the community understands that this is a necessary component of the response. Uh, some may or may not agree with it because it, they, they may think it's a little bit of a heavy-handed approach and it's an inconvenience when you shut a school down or you shut down a daycare that's somebody's child care and that means I as a parent have to take time off now to you know pick up my kid because of somebody else and that's where Jackie had mentioned the kind of peer pressure you know you because you have this religious exemption or this issue of not vaccinating you're affecting me where i had my kid vaccinated but because of all this it caused the school to get shut down and that's how we were kind of sending our message it's not probably the best way from an enforcement standpoint but it does send the message and we continue to inspect schools on a weekly basis on a daily basis in most part and you know we find schools some of them are really large thousands and thousands of kids and we spend several hours there a day going through the attendance records to make sure everything's in compliance so. so yeah i just want to add to that like i think the greatest challenge in this response is how do we you know enforce this how do we like you know put <coughs> the peer pressure on how do we ensure that the safety of all communities are, you know, at the forefront of our decisions, but also make sure we're not stigmatizing this community and also making sure that we're not kind of in bad partnerships, right? Because we've had, in some cases, in parts of the agency, longstanding relationships with schools, with rabbis, with other community partners. And this is not easy for them, right? Especially if they're like, we are overwhelmingly vaccinated and we feel like this is unfair, right? So I do want to be completely transparent and say it's not easy to do this. And it's also a very delicate dance um, when we're trying to think through enforcement, but also information, combating misinformation and ensuring that communities are not stigmatized. So that's the thing. What's the difference between pie and peach? And why did you think it was necessary to change from peach to pie? So peach was actually not something we promoted. Peach is a parent organization <laughs> that oftentimes can, can, can connect with um, parents <laughs> who don't believe in vaccination. Um, so they kind of tagged themselves to some Orthodox Jewish parents, specifically mothers who didn't believe in vaccination, and then put out this extremely long and detailed document that said, this is why you should not vaccinate your child. So then a nurse who's from the community said, oh no, this is not, this is not cool. I don't believe in this. I know that this is bad information. So she took it upon herself to literally combat every point that was made in the in peach and created pie <laughs> so <Our nurses>. yeah. <laughs> so you know peach versus pie it's like a cute kind of thing but right. it, it definitely um targets the <laughs> anti-vaxxing misinformation yeah and i, I would and then, be remiss to say that and it's 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 a good recognition that the women in this community are actually the ones leading the fight absolutely. so this uh, 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 nurse, she's a pediatric, uh, actually, she's an oncology nurse. I forgot if she's a pediatric oncology nurse, but she's an oncology nurse. She's from the community, so she's orthodox herself. She's organized mostly with other 
uh, you know, clinical nurses from the community and basically, you know, leading the pro-vaccination movement to counter this min misinformation. And they know that, the, you know, the, the, the anti-vaxxer groups are targeting the moms because the moms in this particular community are the ones basically running the household. They're the ones, you know, conducting the child care and everything as well, too. Uh, and so, you know, uh, they've been leading this fight and, you know, we need to recognize that we're actually trying to support them in yeah, whatever way absolutely. we can. We helped them actually do some printing of the documents. They gave us permission to actually, you know, post it on our website. We set up other resources as well, too, as far as like uh, a recording on uh, by phone. Uh, and we're like, wow, who listens to a recording on the phone? But apparently when a, when a mom is busy, she doesn't have time to sit down, read something off the internet or print it matter. She will actually turn on her phone, have a, a, you know, there's hotlines in this community, actually turn on a recording, and while she's taking care of the kids, doing something else and prepping dinner, she's listening to this, you know, recordings. So we put this resource together as well, too. So, you know, part of the work that we're trying to do is understanding, you know, we are so diverse in the city and figuring out what works in the community and what doesn't. And the last question I have. Oh, somebody has one. Go So the if you um, actually go to the health department website, there's a very long list of zip codes that have, that have cases in them. If these four kind of zip codes are actually the most um, impacted in terms of they have the highest case count, um, and it's been pretty much between um, Williamsburg and Borough Park have the highest case count and every case count we see every every case count we have per week it's typically in those zip codes um but it is it's not only in those zip codes and those four zip codes because it was overwhelmingly the case count was so large the order went out to try to control that those four zip codes but if you look on online and so here we go yeah these are the uh, neighborhood i will say this is like my like Bullhorn message that um, the zip codes 11205, 11206, 11249, um, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, I know a lot of the language is like, where is that, where is that, where is that? But since I'm in Brooklyn, I want to inform people properly. <laughs> that is actually the areas that are, are impacted. Yeah. And we also need to be clear, too, that there have been a handful of cases <laughs> outside of the Orthodox community. So, again, this affects everyone. You know, and the misinformation is not just in that community. It's everywhere. And so if folks are either delaying or not getting vaccinated, they risk the potential. And I, I will go ahead and recognize, we just announced this yesterday, there are four cases now in, in Sunset Park, you know. Uh, two of the cases, without getting into too much details because of privacy concerns, is that uh, they, they were non-Orthodox, right? Uh, the potential link for exposure was that they you know, probably uh, had some kind of interaction in the communities that had the larger amount of cases, but they're not with us, and they had a religious exemption from getting vaccinated, and they attended public school. And so it's not just in the, uh, the Islam communities, but it's everywhere as well, too. And what happens is that to your question about will we see it expanding in different zip codes, if the misinformation is there or people continue not to get vaccinated, you would not be surprised to see these numbers start to grow more and spread into other communities as well too. That's why you know it's incumbent upon us to let people know, don't be complacent, don't take this for granted. 
you know, folks here in this room, you probably had to check your vaccination history before you entered into school. But if people are concerned, legitimately, just for your overall safety, <laughs> go and see, speak to your doctor, yeah, and you know, find out. And that's what we're telling for everybody. Even if you lived in Staten Island or up in the Bronx, which we have one case up in the Bronx. <clears throat> this person that's, that, that was in the Bronx, they don't, we don't even know, they didn't, they never confirmed through case contact. They, they, they confirmed that they never entered into any of these other areas before. But we know that Bronx is connected to Westchester and Rockland, so there's probably some interaction there, but it was never actually formally you know, confirmed for that as well, too. So this is a human being disease, and we're all human beings. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What the was like, just like, like, what constitutes It's a good question. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. So, under the New York State regulations, um, there are two types of exemptions that somebody can file for not having vaccinations. Uh, the medical <laughs> one is pretty straightforward and generally has to come signed off by an MD, a natural doctor, saying that. So and so has this type of conditions. Because of such, it's preventing them from being able to vaccinate under our recommendation. And then it gets submitted to a school, uh, be it a public school or a private school. And it's incumbent upon that school to keep it on record so that they know in case anything kind of happens. For the religious exemption slash quote unquote philosophical ones, it's like it's against my religion. And that's all somebody can say. They sometimes some people will have doctrines, and we know certain religions do have in, in the doctrine to say that, but it's very, very far and few. It's generally also incumbent on the actual child care providers of the school, um, the daycare, or the after school program. If they choose to accept it, you know, they just have to keep a record of it. And basically, so that in case something happens in the school or there's an outbreak in the area, we can go to them and say, who are your, you know, your unvaccinated kids and what are their you know, exemptions and you need to exclude them. So we actually have an awareness. Um, there's talk uh, and conversation now uh, about changing that. California do, did away with that uh, like a year or two ago. They don't know, they no longer recognize philosophical slash religious exemptions whatsoever. There's also talk at the federal level, um, you know, for that. But well, that's obviously a much more difficult, larger conversation. It, you know, we have to see if anything kind of happens here locally. But we have an outbreak here in New York City. We have an outbreak up in, you know, Rockland as well too. Uh, you know, two of the larger outbreaks. We compromise. You know, we compromise to the, the vast majority of cases overall for the United States. So, you know, that's kind of leading the conversation right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things. One, anybody can always call three one one to you know find a, a location that's closest to them that's convenient. So not necessarily in the outbreak area, anywhere in the five boroughs. If they, you know, regardless of their documentation or background, uh, access to healthcare, if they have no insurance or little insurance, uh, they generally can go into any of the public hospitals or any of the clinics. Uh, and basically receive uh, some type of service or follow-up or health care um, without fear of reprisal or anything like that uh, as well, too. And we, uh, at, our, at our clinics and most of the public hospitals, they provide services in the language that a person's, uh, you know, <clears throat> comfortable in. But some of the work that Jackie and the group, mm -hmm. our community and partner engagement group, is working on is that, you know, we know in, let's say, the Orthodox community, it's not exclusively or orthodox. If you ever go into any of their restaurants or businesses, they will have folks of other different backgrounds, you know, working for them, and it's a concern. And they, you know, they don't. Some, or a lot of them don't know their vaccination backgrounds, and we've heard about this. Uh, we're working actually with a group to try to see if we can organize uh, not only an education forum but potentially a vaccination forum. 
for the venom as well too, because unlike the you know the Orthodox community, which doesn't want you know want services from us directly in that sense, these folks want these types of services where we're going to try to make something happen soon for them, so that they know that they have you know the service available to them. Yeah, so I really think this is where our community partnerships are so paramount. Um, because again, <laughs> through many cultures, many communities, through very legitimate reasons, don't always trust the, the government, right? And so it's up to it, and it really has been up to our community partners who have come to us and said, just like you did right now, you know, this is a this is a group of people that I'm very concerned about. I, you know, have housekeepers who are working in these homes and, you know, are afraid to come forward. Like, how can we get them the information in a way that meets them where they are? And, and then we actually rely on our other community partners to support that need through vaccination events. So that's kind of this where we are now, actually, is really trying to tap into those community partners and understand. And now we're actually trying to be a little more proactive, I think, and saying, okay, well, we know that these are the communities, if you look at like the who should not get vaccinated, right? Well, based on that list, where where are those people in the zip codes and how can we make sure to tap into our community partners to say, what information do you need? What are you hearing? And how can we come together to support getting um, your participants, getting yourself um, the information necessary? So that's that's a really good point. One last question. Can you talk to us about the different types of immunity? <clears throat> and uh, I'm thinking as a child, my mom would say, go play with the kids next door because they had these. Mm -hmm. so that I would get the measles and get my natural immunity. What is so different about measles today that we don't even want to entertain that thought? So I think that the, the event that you're talking about is what they call measles parties. So they used to have uh, chicken pox parties too. So you know, somebody's found out that when somebody's kid had, a, had the chicken pox, it was like, well, you know, we want to expose it to them and get the immunity. You're, you're basically, you know, taking a huge gamble from being exposed to natural measles. And, you know, uh, the reason why I'm saying that is because of all the complications that potentially happen to it. Because one, it's a child, their, their immune system is generally not up to, you know, up to stuff as, as an adult person would be that was, if the adult was healthy. And not only that, you develop can potentially develop, though rarely, complications afterwards from exposure to natural measles. So somebody who's been exposed to natural measles recoups from it. Anywhere from five or 10 years down the road, they could potentially develop encephalitis, which obviously folks know is a swelling of the brain. That only happens with exposure to natural measles. If you do the vaccination, you don't have that chance of developing that as well too. So we have heard about this happening in communities, especially mm -hmm. among those who are anti-vax, um, because we had issued these orders saying, you can't come to school because you're unvaccinated. Well, what happens that, well, you know, I can't keep my kid out of school for like two weeks or a month. You know, I need to go to work and I need to have my kid in school and somebody taking care of them. So they purposely find somebody who had measles, exposes their kid. They don't even seek any health care whatsoever for it. You just keep the kid at home until they've gone over it, maybe give them some Tylenol for the fever or anything like that, give them some Benadryl for the rash. The kid luckily recoups. Now they bring the kid back to school and the school's like, wait, wait, hold a second. You can't, you know, I can't let your kid in. You don't, you're not vaccinated. Oh, no, no, he got exposed, you know, and he's, he's immune now. Well, I don't, I need you to supply, supply me proof. So what they do is now they take that kid to a doctor, they get the titers test, to show the immunity, but the doctor's office reports to us that we did a titers test with somebody. There's no registry, no no indication in the registry that this person has been vaccinated. It's counted as part of our case count. So a lot of these numbers that you see here are coming in retrospectively. So the person's not sick anymore. They may have gotten sick several weeks ago to several months back, but they're trying to either you know 
get around the system in some way or something like that, and we have these kind of checks and balances in place that you know, figure out, and we add the numbers to the case count. That's how we're finding a lot, a lot of, a lot of cases. Well, I mean, to add, like, it's just, yeah, like, I think that's a lot of the arguments that some folks make, but mm -hmm. I think it's in, because it's incredibly um, contagious, kind of viral infection <laughs> or disease, like, so you have the 21 day incubation period, and then there's four days before the rash, and then four days after that they're actually very, very highly contagious. So as a parent, like how how are you to actually know, you know, within that 21 day incubation plus the like, that's a lot of tracking. So there's really no way, not no way, but it's very difficult to make sure that that child is not infecting many, many other people because of its, you know, highly contagious nature. And there are some people who can't get vaccinated. So in addition to like taking the chance of not, of, of you know, getting these complications or just taking the chance of getting measles naturally, you're also putting people at like, if I'm in chemotherapy, if I'm, you know, just had a baby. So now because you decided to do this, you could be putting so many other people at risk because of how highly contagious it is, um, which is why I think we're so strong on vaccination. So, so I noticed in the numbers that there's, a, so there's an Orthodox Jewish community here in Crown Heights and also one in Williamsburg. I noticed that there were only two cases yes. here, but there are more cases in Williamsburg. Is that it? The differences in the communities? So, so as Jackie mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're the Elder Orthodox or the Hasidim, they're, you know, they, they're very insular, but they do travel around the various communities, not just between like Williamsburg, Borough Park, Crown Heights, uh, as far as the Rockaways, there's, a, there's some in Kew Gardens and Flushing as well, too, and then all the way up to Rockland as well, too. Uh, but there are many different sects, many different, you know, folks of, you know, kind of takes little tweaks, like kind of similar to Christianity. You have Christianity, Catholicism, you know, uh, Episcopals and all those other things like that. They're all kind of running similar tracks, but have differences in some of the beliefs. Uh, in Crown Heights, when they had the initial one case, their rabbis came out very, very strong, very staunch. They even <laughs> issued a letter saying, folks in our communities, you need to get vaccinated, you know, do it right now. Williamsburg, it's been tough because there's many, there's many different sects that cover Williamsburg, and we've never been able to actually get the rabbis to come out and agree and to do something like that. So most of them say, yeah, 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 you know, there's nothing in, you know, uh, we're going to go law that prevents vaccination, uh, but there are some rabbis that believe in anti-vaccines. In fact, during when we had a meeting with the, rab with, the, with the rabbis in Williamsburg, there was one rabbi actually handing out anti-vaxxer uh, information. And because there's so much this kind of pervasive misinformation, that's why we're seeing much more cases in you know, Williamsburg and we, we see it on the communities as well too. Like, is that real? Because you know, we yeah, watch so much shows about yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, and yeah, you're 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 talking <laughs> about like you know TV show scenario contagion like <laughs> yeah, outbreak thing. We have those things in place, so um, there's no number per se. I think it would be a concern of mixing up numbers plus spilling out into the public realm. Uh, as well, too. We are, like I said, we have a handful of cases that are uh, that are not in the Orthodox community. If we see those numbers grow, mixed in with the continual growth of numbers in the Orthodox community as well, too, <coughs> there could be, you know, uh, a point. And it's not a definitive number, or uh, you know, it depends on what the actions are. We, you know, we would institute some uh, some more, uh, you know, stringent measures. We there we have a protocol called POD, P-O-D, which is point of dispensary. Uh, I'll give you the extreme version of it. 
is that let's say somebody decides to release anthrax into the subway system. Uh, wherever that was released, whatever neighborhood that was, we have a connection with the local DOE school. We would stand up a point of dispensary, and it's like a, a, basically an assembly line. All It's staffed by all DOH staff, and you basically will come in. Uh, the CBC comes in, gives us a supply of ciclofoxin or another antibiotic. You come in, you pick up the supply for yourself, your family, or any neighbors, and you go right out and take the medication. And it's an assembly line, and we give everybody uh, you know, either pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis in there. So that's a very extreme scenario. <laughs> We've only done that in one or two other instances before. But that's, again, if somebody's willing to actually come and get medication or something from us, um, will it ever come to the point where we actually like close somebody down and give them the inoculation? I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's been obviously talked about. Even our order doesn't go that far. It's just mandating you to do so, and we just issue a fine if we find out that you were doing so. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we uh, you know, right now, because we're under emergency activation, this is kind of the initial layer. There are other layers that we can kind of, you know, just kind of spin up very quickly to try to institute something like that, if, that, if it gets to that point. No, it's so it's a, it's a uh, it's a um, it's uh, it's a it's a civil penalty. It's not a criminal penalty. So the the, the fine will just basically accrue more. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, folks. Uh, the sheriff's department serving the, the, the summonses, uh, but it's not a criminal penalty. It's, it's basically it's just you know now and you know for some <coughs> folks, you know what they said that they rather pay the fine than do it. Uh, but you know they're taking a great risk not only for themselves but for the community as well too. So we're just hoping that the message kind of gets across. Any any uh, last questions? So we actually arranged a phone call with our commissioner and the uh, Israeli health ministry. Um, they're very concerned. They have over 4,000 cases and they've actually had fatalities. Um, <coughs> they've had some successes uh, because you know Israel is a Jewish state. They're able to actually institute these pods but at a local standpoint where people will actually go here it's different uh, if i'm of ultra-dox orthodox background for the most part i will only go and see my own doctors versus somebody else or a stranger that i don't know plus there's also like separation of these kind of nuances like women have to see women and men have to see men or something like that as well too so they've had such success successes with that what they've had difficulties is the contact tracing mm -hmm. that's why they have so many more cases we, once we hear about a case, we start calling the case patient, their family members to find out who is in the household, how many people, is anybody vaccinated, what's their vaccination history, what events they went to, what schools they went to, any other public location that they went to to find out and then try to contact those people as well too to make sure that they're, you know, they're not you know, sick or anything like that. They have less of a, that kind of network in Israel, and they're trying to, you know, get information from us to kind of replicate it. Um, but it's tough because one, we're an international city, you know, we're an issue, we have so many different people traveling from all over the world. There's outbreaks going on in Israel, uh, the Ukraine, Europe, um, I think China, uh, parts of South America as well too, and you know. Um, you know, it's tough, basically, you know, to see where, you know, where a case may potentially come in from because that incubation period is so long. Somebody could be, have it, been exposed, never been vaccinated. They could get off the plane, then it's two or three days later, then start manifesting symptoms. And they don't know, and then get sick or something like that, and maybe you potentially expose a bunch of people. I can tell you for our outbreak, patient zero was uh, a child that was not vaccinated from here in New York City, went with their parents to Israel, got exposed, and then came back, and then basically started this whole domino effect. So. Are there any factors that are actually against vaccination? Um, We've heard of some, but we don't, you know, I think the vast majority that we are aware of 
most of them kind of have had their licenses stripped from them. Yeah. But we've heard some 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 of the doctors take a more of a harm reduction. It's like, well, if you don't want to get vaccinated, that that's up to you. But the vast majority of the doctors that we have interacted with are very they're mm-hmm. they're they're pediatric <laughs> doctors that are in the community. It's just like, no, you need to get vaccinated. You know, stop with this nonsense. Please, you know, make sure for the benefit for yourself, your family, and the community overall. So. Mm-hmm. so that was uh, thank our speakers. Thanks, and we can stay around for a few minutes if anybody wants to speak to us one on one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.